As Americans, we are taught from an early age to value the study of history as a vital part of our education and our identity as a nation. Study of the American West has been extensive. The number of books published is second only to those written about the Civil War. But within all those volumes, references to African Americans are extremely rare. Today, historians are rediscovering the contributions of African Americans, recognizing their impact as a people, and exploring race relations as they played out in the Wild West. In this five-part series, Professor Quintar Taylor focuses on African American history in terms of forming communities, combating racism, and changing social and political patterns in the development of the American West. The African American West is presented by the University of Washington's College of Arts and Sciences and the UW Alumni Association. Major funding for this program was provided by Macy's, continuing its long-term commitment to promoting black history by making this video series available to secondary schools throughout Washington State. Additional funding was provided by the University Bookstore and UW Medicine. In this talk, Professor Taylor examines the paradox of race and freedom in the West in the period leading up to and including the Civil War. Good evening, everyone. My name is David Hodge, and I'm the very proud Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences tonight. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the first of this wonderful lecture series on the African American West, 1528 to 2000. It's great to see so many alumni and friends, um, students and faculty, the greater community here tonight to enjoy this series. This is the 34th year in which we have offered these special lecture series by the History Department, and it is with great pride that the College of Arts and Sciences and the Alumni Association bring this series to you this winter. Now, I want especially to take a moment to thank those of you who are members of the Alumni Association. Uh, your participation in the association and your donations make it possible not only to host this series, but part of your membership goes to provide scholarships for history students. So we're very pleased about that. This series features an outstanding scholar and teacher here at the University of Washington. Professor Quintard Taylor has taught and written about the history of African Americans for over 30 years, specializing in the American West. Over the next several weeks, we will explore much of what students learn in a full quarter or more under his tutelage. During these weeks, Professor Taylor will challenge myths and ask us to think critically about the diverse ancestry that lies in our collective past. It brings us to a common purpose of deepening our understanding of the experiences of all Americans and all persons of the West and expanding our respect and understanding for our different cultures and histories. Professor Taylor was originally from Brownsville, Tennessee, received his undergraduate degree from St. Augustine's College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and his graduate degrees from the University of Minnesota. Professor Taylor joined the UW faculty in 1999 after his previous appointments at WSU, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and just before the University of Washington, the University of Oregon, 1990 to 1999. Professor Taylor is the author of more than 50 scholarly articles and four books. He holds the Scott and Dorothy Bullitt Chair of American History, which was established in 1979. This is the oldest and one of the most prestigious faculty endowments in the college. In addition to an expectation of extraordinary scholarship, the holder of the bullet chair is expected to devote a substantial portion of his or her working time to teaching undergraduate students, something Professor Taylor has done truly exceptionally well. Professor Taylor serves on the Council of the American Historical Society as well as the Washington State Historical Society, the Washington Territorial Commission, and HistoryLink Interactive History Project. He was a founding member of the Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas. We are absolutely delighted to have such a distinguished individual as part of the faculty of the University of Washington, and we are especially delighted to have this opportunity to share him with you. Please join me in welcoming Professor Quintard Taylor. Thank, thank you, thank you. I'm, we have a lot to cover tonight. I'm, I'm going to treat you as my students for the next five weeks, okay? Fortunately, you don't have to take my exams. 
Uh, you can just sit and listen and you will all get A's, <laughs> which is probably the best, best approach. Uh, I, I do want to say that I, I really do appreciate and I'm humbled by the fact that I've been invited to be a part of this lecture series. This is a very important lecture series, as the dean has indicated, it's gone on for 34 years, and there have been some illustrious predecessors, including uh, my dear colleague and friend, Bob Stacy, who's somewhere in the audience. Bob did a wonderful job last year. I won't match him this year, but I'll do my best. Um, I, I also want to uh, make a very special acknowledgement uh, tonight I am dedicating not only this lecture, but all of the lectures to a wonderful woman, a true friend, who is no longer with us. With us. Her name is Mrs. Constance Thomas, and in 1972, she was one of the first people that I interviewed here in Seattle in the process of reconstructing the history of African Americans in the West. I had, I had hoped that Mrs. Thomas would be here, at least in spirit, uh, if not in, uh, presently, but un unfortunately she is not because she passed on January 7th of this year. All of the lectures, as I said before, are dedicated to her. I will acknowledge her son, Ken Thomas, who I've known for 30 some years, who's in the audience. Ken, can you stand up for just one minute? I, I say this because, uh, I'm not standing here uh, alone being responsible for all that you'll hear tonight. What you will hear has come, will come through my mouth tonight, will come through my voice tonight, but it's essentially the words of literally hundreds if not thousands of African Americans and others who have been part of the process of the history of blacks in this region. I hope you will hear those voices carefully. I hope you will hear those voices proudly because they certainly still speak to me. Maybe at, by the end of this lecture, uh, they will speak to all of you as well. I began this five-part lecture series on the African-American West with a simple premise. There is no single African-American historical experience. The lives and histories of blacks in Mississippi or Harlem tell us much about the challenges that African Americans have faced over, over the last three centuries. But their stories are incomplete. They paint an incomplete picture unless and until we know what happened elsewhere in the nation, including the American West. Indeed, we need to know about blacks and their experiences in Helena, Montana, in Phoenix, Arizona, in Seattle, and yes, even in Bellevue, Washington. Uh, often blacks in, in Seattle, and I'm going to uh, put the onus on the local population here, myself included, often we blacks here in Seattle, people who live in the Central District or the Rainier Valley, wrap ourselves in what I call the authenticity banner. We claim that our experiences are truer to the black world than those of our Bellevue cousins. Yet if an African American grew up in Bellevue, and increasingly black folks are growing up in Bellevue, because one of the things you're going to learn is that the majority of black people today in the greater Seattle area live outside of the city of Seattle. Yet if an African American grew up in Bellevue, that is his or her African American experience, and it is as valid as that of someone reared in Harlem or Georgia. But I think the reason for the absence of the Bellevue discussion is that when we historians describe race in the history of the American West, black people are usually left out of the discourse completely. Asian American, Latino, or Native American history are automatically, and I believe correctly, considered Western in orientation, but not black history in this region. In fact, one of the founders of Western history, a man named Walter Prescott Webb, wrote in 1957 that the West is the American region without water, timber, cities, or Negroes. Obviously, Webb didn't come to the Pacific Northwest. This lecture series is intended to challenge Webb's idea. It is easy to ignore the African-American historical experience uh, in this region because of its concentration, or that is the concentration of contemporary black populations in the major cities, such as San Francisco and Oakland and certainly Los Angeles and to a lesser extent Seattle. But if we define the West as that region of the country, uh, beginning with the states that straddle the 98th meridian and that stretch all the way to the Pacific, then as early as 1870, 284,000 African Americans lived in this region, and they comprised 12% of the region's population. As of the year 2000, there were 6.5 million black Westerners, 
who were 9% of the region's total. They were over, also, they were over 90% urbanized. Indeed, I had an interesting encounter uh, when I gave a presentation at the University of Idaho a few years ago. Uh, I, I had given a, uh, a talk on the Black West, and a co-ed walked up to me and she said, yes, this is all good, this is all true, I, I, I assume, but I've never seen a black person in Idaho, so how can you make the argument <laughs> that, they're, that the blacks are part of the West? And I reminded her that in the contemporary world, there are far more blacks in Los Angeles County than there are people in the entire state of Idaho. <laughs> in other words, we are very much a concentrated people uh, today. Yet if we look into the 19th century, we will find that blacks were far more dispersed throughout the region. In 1890, for example, black people lived in every single county in the state of Washington. And indeed, they lived in small towns that you wouldn't identify with black folks or black history today. Places like Roslyn, Washington. And actually, Roslyn at one time had a black majority, but that's the subject of another lecture. There was Winlock, uh, a, a friend of mine is doing research on Winlock, Washington. I'm not sure many of you even know what Winlock is. It's on the way to, to Portland. And of course, there's Pomeroy, Washington. And we could go on and on and on with these various places all over, all over the state of Washington. But reconstructing black Western history is imperative, not simply because of the number of people in the region. Now that diversity is the watchword for social and racial progress in this nation, the West affords us, I believe, a very special opportunity for examining multiculturalism and diversity in a historical context. Indeed, the West is today, and has always been, the most multicultural region of the nation. It is the only region where Asian Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and African Americans have existed in significant numbers along with Anglos. Indeed, the very variety of races was crucial to, to the creation of the modern West. Without it, as my former colleague Richard White remarked, the region, meaning the West, might as well be New Jersey with mountains. <laughs> Finally, these, these lectures will, I hope, answer one major question. Was the West, was the West significantly different for African Americans than the South or the East? Was there a racial frontier beyond which African Americans could experience both freedom and opportunity? I believe the answer is both yes and no. It is yes, as in the success of post-Civil War Western blacks in gaining and keeping voting rights in every single state and territory with the exception of Texas. But it also must be no if we consider the emergence of postbellum discriminatory legislation symbolized by anti-miscegenation statutes and public school segregation in states as diverse as Montana, Arizona, Kansas, and even neighboring Oregon. In other words, when we talk about school segregation, we're not just talking about Mississippi and Alabama. We're often talking about what happened in states uh, that are on the borders of Washington. In fact, Washington provides an interesting footnote. It is one of six states in the entire country that did not have segregated schools written into its laws in, uh, in the 1880s and 1890s. Such ambiguity arising from African American history in the West surely complicates the region's past. That complication begins with the first question that we will address tonight, the nature of slavery and freedom in the West. Now, I don't believe that most of us, most of us who are now Westerners, think about slavery when we imagine the American West. When the Civil War began in 1861, only four Western states had been admitted to the Union, Texas, California, Oregon, and of course, Kansas. And only one, as you all know, Texas, seceded to join the Confederacy. Yet I argue that the West claims of innocence on slavery are, are muted by the presence of black bond servants, black slaves, in every state and territory in this region prior to the Civil War, including, including Washington Territory. Consider, for example, the case of Charles Mitchell. And I knew I would have some difficulty with this. Uh, Charles's brother, Paul, is in the audience. Uh, that's not the Charles Mitchell I'm talking about. He's not the contemporary Charles Mitchell. is not the one we're talking about. The Charles Mitchell that I'm referring to is a 14-year-old boy from Olympia, Washington, who in 1860 stole away on a steamer, the Elijah Anderson, to Victoria, British Columbia. And he did so because he was running away from his master Major James Tilton of Olympia. Major Tilton was not only a prominent citizen in Olympia, he was the surveyor general for the Washington Territory at the time. 
Uh, Charles Mitchell uh, was discovered on the ship as it made its way up the Puget Sound. I couldn't find a better map, so I've got a road map of Western Washington here. But imagine the ship, folks. Use your mind's eye. Imagine the ship making its way from Olympia all the way up to Victoria, and somewhere, maybe by Seattle, Charles Mitchell is, is discovered. And he is, he is confined to a cabin. And it's there that presumably he will stay until he's returned to Olympia and to his master. But, but there are other people who have different ideas. Somehow or another abolitionists in Victoria, BC, gain word, find out that Charles Mitchell was in this ship, that he's being held prisoner. And as a result, when the, ships, when the ship docks in Victoria, they present themselves along with the sheriff, and Charles Mitchell is arrested and taken into custody. He is then almost immediately brought before a judge in British Columbia, and the judge says that since, since Mitchell is now on British soil, British territory, where, of course, slavery is illegal, Mitchell is henceforth forever free. Folks, Charles Mitchell stole away, and luckily, he was able to gain his freedom. Not everybody was pleased with this. There were, there were anti-Canada editorials, anti-British editorials, and certainly anti-abolitionist editorials that would appear in a number of newspapers up and down the Puget Sound, including Olympia, obviously, but also Stilicon. People raise the question, how dare the British and how dare these abolitionists interfere with the property of, of an American citizen? Nonetheless, nonetheless, nothing was done despite the fact that these editorials called for American federal or federal intervention, called for an American note of protest, and maybe even military action. Nothing was done, of course, because this was September of 1860, and soon the entire nation, that is the United States, would be engulfed in the Civil War. Nonetheless, the case of Charles Mitchell shows us that slavery touched our own shores uh, right here in Washington. And indeed, I'm going to refer you to uh, the, the slide on the, on the screen. A. Ludlow Kramer, many of you may know him or may remember him, uh, in 1969 was the, uh, the chairman of the Washington State Commission on the Causes and Prevention of Civil Disorder. As you, some of you may know, Washington had race riots, Seattle especially had race riots in 1967, 1968. There was a commission put together to investigate it. Ludlow Kramer was the, uh, was the chair of the commission. And this is part of what he wrote in, in the preface or the introduction uh, to, to that report. He didn't have Charles Mitchell in mind. But I wanted to include that statement because, in effect, his words sort of resonate with, with that Charles Mitchell story. That indeed, as I said before, slavery touches every corner, every corner of the West, including us right here in Washington, Washington State. Slavery was legal. Slavery was legal in Texas, in the Indian Territory, and in Utah Territory. However, it existed illegally everywhere else, including, of course, in Washington Territory. The 98th Meridian might have represented the farthest advance of slave-dominated plantation agriculture as it, was, as it was practiced in the Old South. We often think of plantations of cotton fields or plantations of sugarcane, but it did not. It, that is, the 98th Meridian, the environmental factors, did not pose an insurmountable barrier to the development of the servile institution in the West. Note, for example, that there were, in the 1850s, slave cowboys in Texas. Indeed, our best evidence suggests that most of the cowboys in Texas were, in fact, slaves. Note, for example, that one-third of the 900 blacks who participated in the gold mine rush in California in 1855, that is, one-third of the blacks who were mining gold, were, in fact, slaves. Let me repeat that. One-third of the blacks who mined gold in California were, in fact, slaves. Note that there were slaves in Berkeley who would be freed by abolitionists in Oakland. I know, this is not the image that we have of California. This is not the image that we, that, that we have of the West. But nonetheless, this was the situation that has evolved. The West was not saved from slavery by any natural environmental barrier, as historians have long argued, or any particular commitment by Westerners to universal liberty. Rather, free soil uh, farmers, mostly white farmers, wanted to end slavery for their own region, uh, reasons. And indeed, many of these free soilers were as anti-black as they were anti-slavery. Take, for example, Peter H. Burnett, who was born in Tennessee, but he eventually becomes a leader in the Oregon uh, legislature. 
He is responsible for many of the anti-black laws that are instituted in Oregon. And of course, he moves to California and he becomes responsible for similar legislation in, in California. But there were also white men in the West who, in effect, wanted a different outcome. Men such as John Brown and Leland Stanford, who were dedicated to the abolition of slavery in the West. John Brown, for instance, and other white Kansans would go into Missouri to free slaves. We'll say more about that later on in the lecture. Moreover, as we shall see tonight, black women and black men played a major part in the destruction of slavery in this region. I think we should also note the complexity of the slavery issue in the West. The West is the only region of the country where Native Americans practice large-scale black slavery in the Indian Territory. Yet only a few, only about five or six of the 500 or so Indian tribes actually owned slaves. But the West also contained uh, New Mexico, where Indian slavery and Mexican peonage uh, precluded the need for black enslavement. In other words, because Indians were enslaved in New Mexico, black people were not going to be enslaved in, in that territory. African slavery in the West begins in New Spain. Nearly 200,000 Africans entered Mexico during the colonial period, and that, that, by that I mean 1521 to 1821. That's a figure that's comparable to the 345,000 who were brought to British North America. And of course, you all know that the 345,000 brought to British North America became the basis for much of the contemporary African American population today. But unlike the British mainland colonies, where large scale, uh, excuse me, unlike the British mainland colonies, large scale intermarriage in New Spain produced a biracial population that soon constituted the vast majority of persons of African descent. The multi-race, that is African, Spanish, and Indian population grew much more rapidly than the unmixed black population rising from 2400, as you can see on this table, 2400 in 1570 up to 369,000 in 1793. Spanish slavery existed in, uh, or slavery existed in New Spain, but it certainly was a far cry from the kind of slavery that existed in British North America. Slavery la rarely lasted for any Africans in New Spain more than one generation. Indeed, the mostly African male slaves who were brought to New Spain quickly realized that they could ensure that their progeny would be outside of the bounds of slavery simply by taking an Indian wife, or in some instances by taking a, a Spanish wife. But I would also argue that slavery was made unnecessary by the abundance of coerced Indian labor. In other words, slavery would never be as crucial, it would be important, but it would never be as crucial to the colonial economy in New Spain as it would be in Virginia or Maryland or South Carolina. Frontier conditions in northern New Spain also made slavery even less of an issue, even less practical. In 1800, there were 40 blacks, quote unquote, in San Antonio. That doesn't include the people who were mixed race. There were 40 blacks in San Antonio. Of those 40 blacks, only six were slaves. If the Spanish colonial policies, however inadvertently, promoted upward social mobility uh, and political mobility among people of color, the Mexican War of Independence enshrined the concept in the Constitution and in the basic laws of the new nation. Mexico's Constitution of 1821 renounced black slavery and proclaimed political equality for all of the nation's inhabitants. The promise of freedom and equality proved the powerful attraction for fugitive slaves and free blacks from the states, that is, from the United States. The Sabin River became a political and racial frontier uh, for a small number of intrepid African Americans who arrived in Mexican Texas in the 1820s. Now, of course, many of these blacks were fugitive slaves from neighboring Louisiana or from the Arkansas Territory or from as far away as Mississippi. But I would also argue that a good number of these blacks who made their way to Mexican Texas were, were in effect free blacks who were seeking out Mexican liberty. Let me give you an example. Samuel H. Hardin, a man who claimed to be a descendant of the first president of the United States, was an African-American, a mulatto, uh, he was a barber in Virginia, but in 1822, he and his wife migrated, or I should say immigrated, to Texas, to Mexican Texas. And he left these words for us. He tells us why he immigrated. He said, and I'm quoting here, Mexico's laws invited our immigration 
and guaranteed our right to own property. Folks, just to put this in, con in, in some, some form of contrast, the rights of free blacks, quote unquote, uh, were diminishing in the period between 1800 and 1860. In other words, with each passing year, free blacks, even in the North, and certainly free blacks in the South, found that they had fewer and fewer uh, rights. The warm views that blacks held toward uh, Mexican Texas were reinforced by the attitude of the government in Mexico City. Mexico's vice president at the time, that is in 1833, Vice President Valentin Gomez Farias, for example, supported the relocation of former slaves in Mexico. Gomez wrote in 1833, if they, meaning the US blacks, would like to come, we will offer them land for cultivation, plots for houses where they can establish towns, and tools for work under the obligation that they obey the laws of the country under the obligation that they obey the laws of the country. Yet I would suggest to you that the aspirations of free blacks and their supporters for a racially tolerant Texas soon conflicted with the desires of Southern whites to transform Mexico into, as one historian called, an empire for slavery. In 1821, Mexican Texas had only 3,200 non-Indian inhabitants. Concerned about the region's vulnerability to annexation, ironically, to the United States, and also the France or Great Britain, the, the, uh, the Mexican government granted Moses Austin permission to settle a colony of American-born immigrants loyal to Mexico along the Brazos and Colorado rivers. And you can see Austin's colony on, on the map here. When Moses Austin died, Stephen Austin, his son, took over the enterprise. The prospect of free land lured European Americans across the Sabin and Red Rivers. As early as 1823, perhaps 3,000 U.S. citizens had entered Texas illegally, and in addition, in addition to 700 legitimate settlers. I always make an aside here. We always talk about the problem of illegal aliens, and we always talk about how that problem is, is one directed toward Mexico as Mexicans move north. The first illegal aliens in Texas the first illegal aliens in Texas came across the Red River in the Sabin from the, United, uh, from the United States. And indeed, they came despite the best efforts of the Mexican army to patrol the border. But these slaves brought, excuse me, these men, for the most part, they were men. These men brought slaves. Jared E. Grossi of Georgia, for example, arrived in, in central Texas in 1822, and he brought with him 90 slaves. These slaves established Bernardo, a cotton plantation along the Brazos River. Grossly, like many of the subsequent arrivals, was convinced that the cash crop, the labor system, and the social relations of the US South, all of which rested on black slavery, could be easily replicated in the bottomlands of the Colorado and the Brazos. And he wasn't by himself in that thinking. Eventually, there would be others who would come. By 1835, Texas slaveholders had duplicated the slave system of the United, of the United States. By that date, there were 35,000 immigrants from the United States and Mexican Texas, including a good number who were illegals. Uh, but that included 5,000 black slaves who were 12% of the population. Indeed, although slavery is theoretically illegal in Mexico, the number of black slaves in Texas was actually greater than the number of Spanish-speaking Mexican citizens. Let me repeat that. The number of black slaves was greater than the number of Mexicans, the number of Spanish-speaking Mexicans. There were only 3,500 3, Mexicans in Texas at that time. The growing numbers of slaveholders demanding the protection of their property while openly selling black slaves uh, excuse me, with growing numbers of slaveholders demanding the protection of their property while openly selling black slaves, that is against the law, anglo Texans and the Mexican government were soon on a collision that would lead to the Alamo. Here you see a map showing uh, the, the, if you will, the battle for Texas independence. I don't call it the Texas Revolution because I assume the revolutions overturned the existing social order. In this particular instance, there was an attempt to try to if you will, establish an old order in the Old South in, in a new area, in a new region. African Americans would soon be engulfed in the middle of this conflict called the Texas War of Independence. For many Texas slaves, the flag of Mexico, rather than the revolutionary's Lone Star, seemed the banner of liberty. In February of 1836, one month before his siege of the Alamo, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana 
commander of the Mexican army, queried government officials in Mexico City about the liberation of the slaves. These are his words. Shall we permit those wretches to moan in chains any longer in a country whose kind laws protect the liberty of man without distinction of caste or color? Santa Ana received the response, which placed the Mexican government clearly on the side of black freedom. On March 18th, the Minister of War, Jose Maria Tornell, wrote, quote, the philanthropy of the Mexican nation has already freed the slaves. He then informed the commanding general to grant these slaves their natural rights, including the liberty to go any point on the globe that appeals to them or to remain in Texas or any other part of Mexico. The Mexican army was poised to become a legion of liberation. As that army marched north and is across the Brazos and the Colorado rivers, moving into the region that was heavily populated by the slaves, the boldest of the bonds people took flight towards Santa Ana's army, both as it marched into Mexico and, or excuse me, and as it marched into Mexican Texas and when they retreated. Anglo slaveholders certainly feared the, quote, abolitionist Mexican army. Soon after the Alamo fell, one Brazoria, a Brazoria a slaveholder wrote, quote, our Negroes were on the tiptoe of expectation and rejoicing now that the Mexicans were coming to set them free. In return for Mexican protection, these fugitives served as spies and messengers or provocateurs for their liberators. For every Mexican, excuse me, for every slave that fled to the Mexican lines, far more took advantage of the confusion and the turmoil of the fighting to make good their escape. Some of the slaves, and these were perhaps the bravest of them all, decided to take their chances with the Comanche and the Comancheros in the West. Far more slaves, though, made their way south to the colony, the black, what would be the fugitive slave colony at Matamoros, which is just south of the Rio Grande. The victory of the Texas revolutionaries over the Mexican army set in motion political forces that in the next decade succeeded in adding all of Mexico's northern territories to the United States. You know this as the Mexican-American War, which would eventually result in the annexation of California and Arizona and New Mexico and a host of other areas in the Southwest. But I would suggest to you that that War of Independence, the Texas War of Independence, also initiated the status decline of free blacks who had previously sought refuge in Texas. Moreover, it fixed African slavery as the predominant labor system in the area. The Texas Constitution, the, the Constitution of the Texas Republic in 1837 was very clear, un, unequivocal on slavery. You can see what it says here. I would also argue that it was, it was equally unequivocal on free blacks. Remember, free blacks have been coming to Texas since 1821, but now they wouldn't have a place. Let me give you examples of this. The Texas Constitution said that citizenship rights shall be granted to all in Texas except, except Africans, descendants of Africans, and Indians. The Constitution also said that no free person of African descent shall be permitted to reside permanently in the Texas Republic without the consent of the Texas Congress. Folks, it's no wonder then that by the time Texas became a state in 1845, there were virtually no free blacks. And indeed, all the way up until the time of the Civil War, the free black population would either be the smallest or the second smallest in all of the slaveholding states of America. The future of slaves, of course, was certain. With the guarantee of governmental protection, Texas's peculiar institution grew from 3,000 African Americans held in bondage in 1835 to a quarter of a million slaves three decades later. Texas thus became the first place where the Old South met the Western frontier. And as such, it became the heart of slavery. What do I mean by this? Texas would have by far the largest slave population. The 1860 US Census reported that there were 182,000 bonds people comprising slightly over 30% of the state's total population. Let me put this in perspective. Blacks were one third of the population of Texas in 1860. Blacks today are probably 12% of the population of Texas. In other words, African people of African ancestry were a much higher percentage of Texas at that time. Indeed, as you can see from this map, there were a number of counties, I think there were about 13 or 14 counties in East Texas and in, in South Central Texas that were predominantly black. 
In other words, we're talking about an institution, the institution of slavery, that was going to become significantly fixed onto the Texas landscape. Texas slaveholders boldly proclaimed their right to own their fellow human beings. Let me give you the example of a justification uh, from, uh, from one judge in 1860. By the way, I, I put this up because we always talk, historians talk in terms of statistics, you know, we give you these numbers and these figures. I want you to see the face of slavery in Texas. These are two slaves, uh, two of the thousands, the 182,000 black slaves in Texas. The, the, the woman uh, on, the, uh, on the right is actually a slave in Brownsville, Texas. That's as far south as you can go and still be in Texas and still be, in fact, uh, in the United States. Yet I would argue, I would argue that slavery was never completely secure in the Lone Star State. The problem, as Texas slaveholders were quick, quick to note, was far more, uh, far more of a difficulty than in the Old South. Texas, despite its vast size, or maybe because of its vast size, uh, was bordered on three sides by places that offered opportunities for flight. First, there was Indian territory to the north. Not that Indian territory wasn't a slave territory, but there were vast tracts of land in Indian territory where one could, could go, where one could literally live as a, a quasi-free person. Then, of course, there was the West, and we've already mentioned those who took their chances to go with the Comancheros and the Comanches and the Apaches. But most importantly, there was Mexico to the South. Indeed, these two statements reflect the role of Mexico in the thinking of slaves and in the thinking of slaveholders. Notice these two statements. The first is from Felix Haywood, and you will hear from, them, uh, from him uh, again in this lecture. But also look at the uh, San Antonio Ledger, a pro-slavery paper uh, in 1852, its statement in 1852. And indeed, we don't have time for this, but there is a tremendous amount of effort on the part of Texans to literally try to get back slaves who, were, who have gone into Mexico or to buy Mexico. That is, Texas congressmen use whatever influence they have. I'm glad they're not, they weren't as powerful then as they are now, but they use, use their congressional influence to try to buy uh, if not all of Mexico, certainly, uh, certainly northern Mexico, in order to take care of the slavery, uh, slavery problem. This view of Mexico, the image of Mexico as a place of refuge, as a haven for fugitive slaves, of course, evolved during the Texas War of Independence. By 1851, 3,000 fugitives lived south of the Rio Grande, and another 1,000 joined them by 1855. But the Civil War ultimately brought an end to bondage in Texas. Because of its remoteness from the major areas of conflict, Texas became a refuge for slaveholders from, rest of the, from, the, uh, from the rest of the South. For example, blacks, oh, excuse me, uh, blacks were brought in from Alabama, black slaves were brought in from Alabama, they were brought in from Tennessee, they were brought in from Mississippi, they were brought in from all over to Texas because Texas slaveholders and those who were bringing them in from the various other states believed that Texas would be the last place where the Union attacked. And in that regard, they were right because Union armies did not reach Texas, did not reach Texas until June 19th, 1865. And of course, that date is going to loom very, very large. On that date, uh, Union forces landed at Galveston, where Major General Gordon Granger issued General Order Number 3, which you see on, on the screen there, which e effectively became the Texas Emancipation Proclamation. The day of emancipation from that point on would be called Juneteenth. In other words, we see the birth of what would at first be an African-American holiday and later a holiday for a whole host of people throughout the West and throughout the nation. As news of the emancipation spread throughout Texas, that is, as the Union Army marched across Texas, the vastness of Texas, the reactions were predictable. Obviously, uh, the slaveholders were dejected. Obviously, the, the blacks were elated. Felix Haywood said, and I'm quoting here, soldiers, and he's talking about the Union Army, Soldiers, all of a sudden, was everywhere, coming in bunches, crossing and walking and riding. Everyone was singing. We were all walking on golden clouds, unquote. Yet many newly freed slaves were uncertain about the future that they faced. Listen to the words of Margaret Nillen, who spoke for many of them when she said in 1865, in slavery, I owed nothing. Excuse me. In slavery, I owned nothing. In slavery, I owned nothing. In freedom, I own a house and I raise a family. All this causes me a lot of worriment, and in slavery, I had no worriment. 
but I'll take freedom every day. Let me move our discussion to the next area of, of significant uh, slave ownership, and that was the Indian Territory. Again, this is, this is something that uh, a lot of people find it hard to believe because we have one image of Indians. Well, I'm gonna perhaps con uh, contest that image tonight. Like Texas, the five Indian nations, the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, the Choctaws, and the Seminoles had an economy which rested on slave labor. 7,000 slaves in Indian Territory in 1860 comprised 14% of the total of the population. There were three ways in which blacks were incorporated, had been his historically corp incorporated into Indian nations as slaves. First, there was indigenous slavery among Native Americans, among the Cherokee and the Creek, where, where the Cherokee and the Creek had held other Indians or Indians from other tribes, and then eventually they began to hold blacks in much the same manner. But there were also blacks who were sold or given to Indians, particularly in the Southeast, in the 1700s. And usually this was a way of paying debts. And as a result, black slavery was introduced subtly into the Indian nations. But the major process by which black slavery came to Indian uh, nations was when white traders married into Indian populations, usually when they married into Indian elites, and they brought with them their slaves. And as a result, those slaves would be handed down to the descendants of, of these traders and the Indian women that they married. This was the most likely path, and it was also the basis, unfortunately, for growing class divisions between and among the Indian peoples who held slaves. Indeed, the ownership of black slaves was a sign of two things for Native Americans. First, it was a sign of the conversion, quote unquote, to civilization, and secondly, it was a sign of status and wealth, much like it was in the Old South. But slavery was strengthened and indeed made, uh, made even more difficult for African Americans by one of the most ironic of experiences, the Trail of Tears. You all know, most of you know something about the history of the Trail of Tears, and you know this as an arduous uh, struggle, an arduous, a difficult situation for Native Americans. You know, you probably know the statistics, more Native Americans died along the Trail of Tears than were killed in all the, quote, Indian wars the nation had fought up until that time. But what you probably don't know is that a good number of those Native Americans, those 60,000 Native Americans who came west over the Trail of, Trail of Tears were actually black slaves. Uh, typical of these slaves were the ones who belonged to the George Lowry family. George Lowry was a, a Cherokee slaveholder. He left his home in Georgia in September of 1838. He left what he termed a comfortable estate in Georgia for the, for the trek to the Indian Territory. Now, I don't, I don't doubt that it wasn't difficult for him, and I don't doubt that he was resentful of the fact that he had to leave his comfortable home. But George Lowry was at a much greater advantage than most Indians who made the trek to Oklahoma or to Indian Territory because he brought with him slaves. He brought with him slaves. Five months later, Lowry settled eight miles south of Tolika, uh, the capital of the Western Cherokee Nation, and there his slaves soon had several hundred acres of land under cultivation. I want to show this next slide. These are two contrasting images uh, of the slave system in Oklahoma. What you see on the left is an Indian slaveholder's house. It looks like the typical plantation house that you see in the South. What you see on the right is a slave cabin, which also looks like the typical slave cabin that, you, that you'll see in the South. Eventually, Lowry constructed a substantial house. This is not his house, but he, more than likely, he constructed a house very much like this, a substantial house, now on a plantation that he called the Greenleaf Plantation. With slave labor, Indian planters in the West could clear more acreage and make more improvements on their land than those Indians who were too poor to own slaves. Uh, the work of black slaves in the Indian Territory differed little from the tasks of bond servants in the slaveholding states such as Texas or Alabama or Mississippi. I'm not going to go through all of this, but essentially black men.